Okay, we are live. Uh, welcome everyone to today's Power Talk at Scale for Success. So how a virtual assistant can save you time, money, and headaches. And uh, very, you know, very pleased, very excited to uh, bring this topic uh, to you today. It's something that is uh, close to my heart uh, in terms of how to scale up a practice, how to start. Um, and uh, with me representing today, we have Kim. So, uh, welcome, uh, Kim. Welcome, everyone, to today's webinar. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here and talk about my favourite topic. <laughs> okay. So, uh, for those who may not have uh, been to one of our webinars before, my name is Damien Adler. I am uh, one of the co-founders of Powdery um, and head of customer success um, at Powdery. I'm also a registered psychologist um, in uh, Australia and a co-founder of a group uh, private psychology practice, which is how we originally got uh, and how Powdary started. So my wife uh, is also a psychologist and we started a psychology practice uh, many years ago uh, from scratch and scaled it up to be a, uh, a medium-sized uh, practice and we just sold it um, earlier this year. So uh, I've got experience both uh, directly in the administration of, uh, of uh, health practices um, along with, of course, the software side of things. Now, joining me today, we have Kim. Very excited to have you uh, here, Kim. Um, perhaps if you could give a brief sort of introduction about yourself and uh, how you are, you know, working in the space that you are and what you do. Sure. Um, yeah, so I have been working as a VA, so a virtual assistant, to therapists in private practice for around seven years, started in 2016. And I just had my son and... I was working in logistics and decided that that wasn't going to be a good path to continue down. I actually wanted to see my son. So <laughs> I, um, I took redundancy and uh, yeah, I was just being a mom and I met somebody who was a therapist and she was just struggling a bit with invoicing and bookkeeping, things like that, and just kind of asked if I could help. So I just, that's exactly what I did, just started helping a friend and then that just kind of snowballed into somehow I now own a business <laughs> and an agency. So yeah, so yeah, I've worked with therapists for a long time. And when um, the pandemic, uh, you know, came around in 2020, that really catapulted my business and um, everybody moved online, but people didn't know how to do that. And so they were reaching out to uh, VAs more than they were before. And I would help people set up systems. And that's how I came across Power Diary. And yeah, so that's what I've been doing. And now I've got, you know, courses helping therapists um, set up their practice themselves. So if they're not ready for a virtual assistant yet, you know, I've got courses in that. And then I also have an agency um, of VAs. And yeah, I love it. I just like, I don't know how I got into this, but I love it. <laughs> and it seems like a very, uh, a very natural fit for you. In, and uh, we, we spoke a, a bit ahead of time of our interview today to kind of uh, get a bit of a uh, more of a sense and and the one of the things I really like uh, about your approach is you really sort of understand the operation of health practices so uh, and what the administrative kind of requirements are and I think also the um, you sort of understand the psychology of health practice owners as well and um, how to kind of really help them and uh, so it's it's wonderful to have you uh, joining us today and, and really kind of sharing you know your experience and your expertise in this, and uh, I think uh, people will get a lot out of it. So uh, no, thank you, and it's uh, great to have you here. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So let's um, have a, a bit of a look at what we'll be looking um, at today and what we'll sort of cover. So we've got a bit of a, uh, a list here, um, and we'll use a, a presentation to keep a bit of structure, but really we'll just kind of talk through some of these kind of uh, key sort of topics. So we're going to look at... Um, when to integrate a virtual assistant into your uh, practice. So, you know, what what gets optimal results and when do you kind of go about doing that? Um, some key criteria and ideas that you have about finding the right service and maintaining, importantly, confidentiality and some of the issues that we know that in the health space, particularly is sort of important. Um, some best practices we'll talk about, you know, for that kind of seamless collaboration and making sure that it all works and it's a good um, fit. Um, and then, some information about what to delegate. And I think this will be, you know, very interesting um, to, to talk about in a bit more detail because, you know, it, it, um, by delegating, we can sort of really supercharge 
efficiency and productivity. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about what you can delegate because I think it's often more than what maybe people think about automatically. Uh, do you find that that it's uh, what they might originally think they need um, when you're speaking to them and setting things up that it's a uh, there's, there's often more you can offer them perhaps what they originally had in mind? Oh yeah, definitely. I think people usually come because there's a certain area that they're struggling with, whether that's, we well, won't go into all, all of it now, I won't give it all away now, but whether that's sort of inbox management or invoicing, that's usually the two that people kind of come come first of all but yeah. then they realize that there's so much that they can actually hand over and they can just concentrate on doing exactly you know what it is they enjoy and what they're good at and what they're qualified for yeah yeah absolutely and i think that's something that is uh, a commonality that um when we were when we were talking ahead of time that you know a lot of the drive behind power diary is to you know help people do what they love doing you know and for health practitioners very few people i think study to become a health practitioner because they love administration. Right? <laughs> um, and uh, I think it's a very rare occurrence. And, and often even, I wouldn't say it's entirely a mutually exclusive skill set because, you know, we do see people that are very good at uh, administration and also good at health um, being a health practitioner. But often you know, people will find that they uh, really enjoy and are passionate about their health service provision, but the admin and the running of a business, right, is something that, uh, is not necessarily a natural skill set or a, a comfort zone for them. And, and certainly from a training point of view, there isn't typically much, if any, training in many of the educational sequences that um, land you as a health practitioner. So it's uh, you know, something that um, uh, you know, I think that you, you kind of pick up on as well is that you know, this is an area that uh, you can, people can potentially outsource, you can take care of it for them. and um, and often, you know, it's a, a frees them up to do, like you said, what they do best. Yeah, and that's definitely what I find. I do think when, um, particularly like therapists, like psychotherapists, counsellors, when they kind of start a private practice, they don't really believe that's a business. Right. It's like yeah. I've, I've trained to be a therapist, I've trained in this, and I want to work for myself, but they don't have that business mindset necessarily or even thinking oh this is a business and they kind of go into it thinking I want to help people obviously yeah. and I want to you know I'm doing it because I love it but actually if you don't also have that business mindset and realize you are running a business it can be just you know direction to not making any money yeah. being unsatisfied you know and and resentful because you're not you know you're not earning enough or things like that so it's really important I think to realize straight away even if you're just qualifying you don't have any clients that you have a business when you yeah. start a private practice it is a business yeah. and you need to you know get some skills in that area yeah uh, absolutely and i think this leads nicely into this idea of when to work with a virtual assistant because um there's different points that people could um uh, potentially seek services so there's obviously early uh, and then there's obviously late, you know, when too things late. are already <laughs> too late, exactly, things are sort of not going so well. So from, from your point of view, um, there are sort of like three areas, right? So the finances, client retention and personal life. Let's dive into those a little bit more um, when we're saying looking for the signs. So when it comes to, say, finances, what sort of things, you know, should people be looking out for here that might be an indication that really it's time to get a virtual assistant? This is assuming that they didn't get a virtual assistant right from the start. Of setting up their practice yeah. but if they're uh if they're running a practice um you know, what sort of things uh do you think they what are the flags there that uh you know that they that they need one from a financial point of view so what i find when it comes to finances is it's all around invoicing mm -hmm. and where they're struggling either with reconciling the payments. So they are constantly checking their bank account, seeing who's paid. They're kind of not on top of that. They're owed lots of money, um, whether they're using medical insurance and things like that, because managing medical insurance, I don't know what it's like in other countries, but in England, it's like, it can be really time consuming and hard because, you know, they don't pay on time and there's also excess and it's, you have to really manage that, you know, mm -hmm. that whole process. Um, you know, people have a certain number authorised and you need to keep track of how many they've had and things like that, which Power Diary helps with amazingly. Yeah. But yeah, so for the finances, it's really around not 
being able to feel in control of them, yeah. um, not know, not invoicing your clients, expecting them to just pay without an invoice, not not knowing if people have paid, being owed money. So that's yeah. kind of like with finances where people come to come to a virtual assistant usually. Yeah, and at that point, if they're late in doing that, they'll often find that they're typically owed a lot of money, right? And they don't, but they don't necessarily have a sense of they know the bank account's low, they know the cash flow isn't good because there's a ways out goings, but um, th there's often that kind of state of feeling something is wrong. It's not being financially rewarding, but it's really, um, and that sort of not knowing where their finances are at is a sort of source of stress in itself. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. That, that's something that we, we certainly uh, see as well when we're working with with uh, customers and um, that, you know, in Power they can, uh, automatically add services and it'll generate the invoice and, and so forth. But what we found, especially in the kind of earlier days, is that um, people would, sometimes wouldn't use the invoicing, um, you know, feature. Mm -hmm. They would have maybe some other way that they would be doing invoices prior to adopting um, Powdery. And often the sort of things that you were describing would be common that, you know, people would like come to us and say, hey, I want to start using the invoice and I haven't been doing it. And when we talk to them and help them, Get their invoicing set up and um if, if they weren't sure you know how to do it um the things that you were describing were very common that they sort of would feel under financial pressure they'd feel um often a bit overwhelmed you know because they weren't really clear on who owed money and um, were spending a lot of sort of time on that and of course sometimes are in under financial duress as well um and so this is something that uh yeah, so if, you've, if you're finding you're struggling to keep up with the financial side of it, a good flag uh, or a good sign that maybe a virtual assistant can really kind of help take that pressure off you and, and take care of some of that. Okay, yeah. and the second one you, you've mentioned here is around client retention. Um, and this is something that, you know, you were saying either complaints coming from clients or issues with retaining clients. Um, what have you noticed there with, with customers, you know, over the years um, in relation to client retention being an issue um, or client complaints? Yeah, so I do find that a lot of people really focus on the marketing side and getting new clients and things like that. And yeah. to me, obviously, that's important. You always need that, you know, people don't stay in therapy forever. Yeah. And, you know, even if they are in long term therapy, they might need something different and go to someone else. So we're not trying to keep clients that don't need yeah. us anymore. But yeah. or not us, I'm not a therapist, but you know what I mean? The, yes, the yes. Therapist. Yeah. But it's about losing clients before that time losing wow. clients before they're ready to move on because you're not giving them good customer service yeah. outside of the therapy room yeah. um obviously what happens in the therapy room is so important and you know the main reason that someone would stay but if it if they're finding it really hard to book with you if they can't get hold of you to reschedule or you don't have clear you know cancellation policies and sometimes you're charging them for a missed session and sometimes you're not um, if they, yes, yeah, so and if they can't book, if they can't reschedule, and then just if they can't get hold of you, and just having that customer service kind of outside of the therapy room, you know, making it really hard to pay, like kind of going back to finances a bit, if it's hard for them to pay, or, you know, they've forgotten to pay, and then they feel really anxious about the fact that, you know, they haven't paid, and you haven't asked them, and the things, you know, the bill's just building up. So people will leave yeah. for stuff that happens outside of the therapy room. Yeah. And so if you're having a really high turnover of, of clients, that's also a big red flag to needing some help yeah. you know, with your admin. Yeah. And it's often the simple things that um, a virtual assistant may be able to help with it is going to move the needle with that, right? Because it may be yeah, improving that communication, making sure there's follow up if people contact for administrative matters that that's being handled um, efficiently. And I think the other, the other point, to add, I think around this, and certainly we found this in our in our practice, but we see it with with customers. It doesn't matter whether it's in Australia, UK, or customers in the the US. I think these these thing, themes are universal. But the, the customers that leave because they're a bit disgruntled about a customer service issue or something, it they're kind of invisible in a way because they kind of drop off, and you don't necessarily kind of notice um, straight away. But then that person also goes back, if they were referred by a doctor, for instance, that person might go back to the doctor and they're maybe less than enthusiastic in how they speak about the service. And it, it, like you said, it may be nothing to do with the therapy or the health treatment that was provided, that would have been great. But um, 
you know, a patient evaluates the whole kind of service and their demeanor when they're talking to their doctor or the, whoever referred them if there was a referral, you know, that can really get impaired by that like lack of customer um, service. And, and that sort of does a lot of damage to, to businesses, I think, and to practices um, that is silent. You know, it's not, um, you know, people often won't overtly go out and complain. You know, they'll just quietly sort of go elsewhere or just not rebook. You know, um, and and we, we see that. So when we see a practice that really has very sharp, really customer focused, you know, customer service, like you're describing, that practice will tend to do well and continue to do well. Like it will sort of be a, a snowball effect. Um, whereas ones that struggle, like you say, that it it um, it's like a drag on their business that they don't necessarily sort of see. And certainly the uh, the cost or the you know the of hiring a, a virtual assistant or something or um, will significantly be offset <laughs> and be dwarfed by the benefit in that kind of regard. Um, now the third thing here is around personal life. Um, what do you see like when people come to you? And I, I imagine when we're talking about personal life, it's when people are sort of coming to you late in the in the process, so they've perhaps got their practice up and running. And what sort of things do you see? from um, from you know, prospective clients when they come in and it's affecting their personal life and you know that they need a virtual assistant. So what are the telltale signs that you think people should look out for? So I think if it's them working more than they want to, yeah. you know, if, for example, they work in the day seeing clients and then they're doing a lot of work in the evenings or even at weekends. And so it's really just like taking over their life, like the business is taking over their life. And that's kind of where it is, you know, their families might be complaining to them, you know, their husbands, wives, kids, you know, whoever it is, are complaining that they're working too much. And, and they just feel, you know, getting to a point where they're like burning out, you know, they're yeah. getting burnt out from the whole process. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, and, and you find in the mix of the work they're doing too, like is uh, a lot of that extra stuff is the admin work that really could be you know, outsourced or someone else could do it if, if perhaps they, um, uh, if they're trying to kind of carry it all themselves. Yeah. And also on top of that, you know, and I know we'll get into this later, but a lot of the time when that's happening, it's because there aren't any like standard operating procedures and things yeah. like that, where yeah. a virtual assistant can put them in place. Yeah. So if they are, you know, if a therapist is working, let's say 20 hours a week on admin, they could probably reduce that by hiring a virtual assistant and only pay them maybe like 10 hours. And that's like, that's huge. Like I don't work with any clients. I do 10 hours a week apart from like really big group practices. Yeah. So I think as well, that's a really important thing to kind of note. It's just because you're working X amount of hours on your admin, it doesn't mean an assistant will because a VA is an expert in admin and they will put in processes and procedures to cut some of that. Yeah. So some of the stuff you're doing doesn't even need to be done. Yeah. You know, yeah. like for yeah. example, with like the bookings and even invoicing, if you're using a system like Power Diary, invoicing can basically be like wiped out. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas you might be doing it all manually currently. Yes. So it is about weighing up the time you're the time you're doing versus yes. what you could systematize with yes. things that you pay for, like a system you pay for, and then an admin person that can do some of that work that A, you don't enjoy, B, you're not very good at, and C, takes you a really long time. Yeah. And that all of that stuff won't be the case with an assistant. They will enjoy it. it will, they will be good at it, and it <laughs> won't take them very long. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very important reminder, isn't it, that it's not going to be a one-for-one -one, uh, yeah. uh, uh, translation of time. And I think uh, running our, our practice, it was something I used to be very overt with with our um, admin team, is that I couldn't do their job, right? Like, you know, <laughs> um, because I don't have the skill set in the same that they're experts in uh, in administration and would be far more efficient. You know, their worst day would be better than my best day when it comes to, <laughs> to administration because... You know, that's what they think about all day and optimize and uh, on top of it. So uh, it's a good reminder, like that it's, uh, that's right. It's not, not a one for one. Okay, let's uh, jump, uh, jump on to, you know, people that are new to private practice. Um, because I think there's, uh, I think uh, we've touched on this a little bit before, but you've got some advice based on your experience over the years of kind of seeing um, the way, the different pathways that people um, start practices and when they come and, and seek your services. But you had a few tips here around uh, what they should do or what can be really helpful early on if people are starting private practice. So first one, take a business course. 
Uh, and what sort of course do you have in mind here when you're thinking about a business course? So we're not talking about a, an MBA, right? Like a, no. <laughs> what, what sort of things do you have in mind here do you think to sort of make a difference uh, for, for practitioners? I mean, re- they can be really basic courses. I'm sure most governments have free courses that you can take. I know in England they definitely do. And there's so you can just do an online course just about starting a business. And really you want to one of the main things you want to learn about is expense, you know, your expenses yeah. and your um so basically being able to do your bookkeeping because yeah. you want to know what it is that you can expense because you don't want to be paying too much tax yeah. for the work you're doing when you can offset some of that. But also just understanding, you know, what it takes to run a business. Um, and like I said, this can be done for free or or just with some, you know, a short online course, really. Nothing, nothing major. Yeah. And you can sort of learn an awful lot very quickly, can't you, with some of those um, and I think most uh, most countries in which we operate, so uh, uh, we will tend to have, like you say, a government uh, funded. Sometimes there'll be professional bodies that will offer them as well that are um, online courses that you can do that just sort of orient people to the sometimes just the legal requirements of running a business, um, some of the things, a few tips and tricks um, there as well. Um, so it definitely, I, I hope you agree with that. The second one is to establish the SOP. So these are the standard operating procedures um, for things. And this is something that we, um, so with Power Eye, we we actually built an um, online manual uh, and integrated it in and, and, uh, and all accounts have that for this very reason. But rather than me talk about why we did that so much, it's probably more interesting to hear from you. Like, why do you think um, SOPs are so important and even particularly at the start, you know, of uh, setting up a business. Because I think people don't necessarily think about it. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I think SAPs are are so important because if you don't have them, each of your clients are going to get a different experience with you. And that's not what we want. We want everybody to have the same experience, have the same, you know, rules kind of thing. You know, if you have um, a cancellation policy or a no-show policy, you want everyone to experience that same policy you don't want to be able to say to one person oh oh I'm not going to charge you for that because of x reason you know you want to have those things thought about up front yeah. and there is never too early to do SOPs you know but it's also never too late so if you don't have any now and you are established it is worth just taking some time to sit down and have a think about all of the policies and procedures that you have in your practice and I've got I've got a free resource called uh, the private practice workflow which is not the greatest name but anyway, that's what it is. And um, what it is, it's, it helps you think about every single process from the whole client journey. So from inquiry all the way to the final, you know, session. Yeah. And so there's some questions in there to kind of, uh, you know, to get these answers out of you. But what you really want to think of when you're doing like your practice paperwork, so you could do this alongside your practice paperwork and have all your procedures in there and then have them, you know, typed up somewhere else, like in, you know, the manual, yeah. uh, which is great. It's such a great idea to put everything in one place so that everybody can see it in the business and things like that. Um, but, yeah, you want everyone to have the same experience. You want to understand how you're going to deal with each incident as it comes up. Yeah. And you want to think about that from a place of like, I'm not thinking about you know, John Smith, whose dad's just died and I feel really bad for him and he's cancelled late notice. You want to think about it from, I'm not considering any client. I'm just, this is what I need for my business. This is what's right for the clients. And then, you know, having that in place so that you don't have to constantly make different decisions throughout the day about what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. I I think that's a really nicely put. And I I think it also, when there are established policies and a consistent way of doing things, I think it, gives uh, patients more confidence in the service they're receiving too because it's very organized and know what to expect. They can That can be flagged up front. It can be reinforced through that the client journey and it's very consistent um, and, and doesn't feel that things are kind of being made up on the fly, which kind of introduces, you know, like it can introduce sort of, uh, I think, uncertainty or a question about the um, professionalism sometimes of the 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 practice and it's you know often unfair in a way because you know the you know practitioners by and large are working very hard to provide a great sort of health service but sometimes these things can sort of detract you know accidentally from that that um that overall experience 
I think the other the other thing too around the importance of, of SOPs, so standard operating procedures or just you know, policies of how you like things to be done, is that it reduces the dependence of the operation of the practice on a single person. So, you know, it reduces it instead of it revolving around the ideas that are stored in the head of a practitioner or even if that they that there is a um, either in-house admin or a virtual assistant who's involved if those things are sort of documented um, then you know then something happens to the person that has it all in their head <laughs> um, then it's very hard to scale it's very hard you know for the practice to operate without that person and means that you know it's it you know introduces the business weakness it also means that if someone has a personal issue or they leave the practice or something happens um, then all of a sudden people can find themselves in trouble so you know it doesn't you know i think when people think about sops you know or, or having a a policy or a manual that they sort of make it more complicated in their head than what it is but it's it could just be dot points about this is how this is our no show cancel you know our late cancellation policy and this is how it operates this is you know this is what we information we send out to new patients you know and it's just that kind of uh, and the time frame that we do it those those simple things that are inside people's heads often um, and getting that documented uh, somewhere if you use power Diary, of course you can use put it in inside the practice manual um now the also, first, oh yeah go also, ahead just, yeah. sorry just with that one as well you also don't want somebody that you've hired making decisions right. for your practice right. either yeah. so yeah. you you don't want a client turning around to you and saying oh you know let's say kim yeah. kim oh kim said i had to pay for my session last week but you don't even know that they've <laughs> made you know that so you want to have those either you do them by yourself or you work with an assistant and we always do this so like um we're not taking on clients now but when we do take on clients this is the first thing i do i won't work with somebody unless they go through these procedures with me because i'm not going to just take on you know something and not understand what's going on in the practice so we actually go through that private practice workflow together yeah. um at the start of a meeting and i would suggest doing that with anybody that yeah. you start working with is just go through those two so they are 100 percent sure of how they you know how they should speak to your clients what the rules are around certain things and you know things like that yeah yeah absolutely and then the uh the third point here was around um when people are setting up a practice is to consider the cost of doing your own um admin and so this is sometimes a barrier right so people will think about um engaging a virtual assistant or or someone in-house but um, they'll think of it as an additional cost. Uh, but what's the counterpoint here that you think is really important for people to sort of think about and to factor in? Well, I think the first point is what I said before about how many hours you're doing. Yeah. So I would hope that as a therapist, you are charging a lot more per hour than what a virtual assistant would. So all those hours that you're working doing admin, that is costing you because it's it's hours you can't see clients, right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's say, let's just take 10 hours. Let's say you're doing 10 hours of admin a week and you usually charge a hundred pounds. So that's a thousand pounds, right? That you're, you're, it's costing your business to do that. Yeah. Whereas you could take on one extra client and outsource and you'd probably be cost neutral. Yeah. Like having one extra client, not doing those 10 hours, but doing yeah. one client hour a week. Yeah probably paying the virtual assistant for five hours yep. at a much reduced rate. And you're probably going to end up being like, so you'll take on one more client, you'll hire the virtual assistant, you don't have to do the 10 hours work, and you're not losing any money. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying about you might be spending 10 hours, but the virtual assistant isn't going to be yes. and you can replace those 10 hours just, just with one extra client yeah. Yeah. per week, and you'll cover that cost. Yeah. Um, just an ex as an example, I used to work with a psychologist and he rented rooms out. So he did invoicing for that room rental every month. Yeah. He used to charge £200 an hour and see six clients a day. So yeah. one day he would not work at all and he would just do the invoicing. He would lose like £1,200, yeah. right? If I've done yeah. my maths right. Yeah. On top right, of my yeah head. Um, he, great. Right. So he'd lose £1,200 yeah. for that day. Yes, yes, he was doing his invoicing, but that was, you know, all that money he was losing. Yes. And so he wasn't seeing his clients losing £1,200. In the end, finally, he um, 
you know approached me to work with him at the time I was only charging 20 pounds an hour and I did his invoicing in two hours <laughs> so it cost him 40 pounds to outsource this yeah. job yeah and he was then able to earn 1200 pounds so yeah. in fact he gained 1160 pounds yeah and yeah. got all his invoicing done. He wasn't stressed because he absolutely hated this, which is why it took him six hours because he used yeah. to do an hour and then go for a walk and yeah, hit yeah, something because yeah. he'd yeah. get annoyed. You know? He probably procrastinated as well, I'm sure, because he doesn't like doing the... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, he yeah. didn't have a good process. He didn't yeah. have all these filters set up, which I set up for him, so he didn't have to sift through thousands of emails to see what were late cancelled. I filtered all that out, took all that away. Yeah. So, you know, getting somebody who knows how to do it can do it so much faster and then can save you money because then you can work and do yeah. the thing you like doing for yeah. more money. Yeah. So, you know, I do think that it's like that, is it sunk cost fallacy where you think like, oh, it's not costing me money by me doing it. I'm yeah. saving money, but actually you're really not. And you're just causing yourself so many more headaches by doing things that you just don't enjoy and don't, yeah. you know, you don't want to do. That's right. I think it, it, it taps into this idea of opportunity cost, right? So we, we think about the costs of, okay, we hire a virtual assistant, we're going to pay X amount. And so that comes to our mind very easily. But the opportunity cost is the flip side, as, as you're describing. So it is, you know, what are the opportunities I'm passing on or that I'm missing out on because I'm doing it myself and um, and the inefficiencies, you know, of that. And I think when uh, uh, my wife and I first started our private practice, so um, we, we sort of had the idea from the start that we were going to make it a group practice um, and, you know, she started in it first. I stayed working in the, I was working in the public sector, so I stayed working there to keep the money coming in while we uh, built built the practice. But um, very early on, we looked at it and realised, okay, it didn't make sense to have an in-house um, admin person because we were very small. But what we realised is that um, if my wife was in a, uh, in a console and we missed um, a phone call, for instance, to the practice, uh, and that could be a, a doctor who might be a potential referral source. It could be um, a patient directly wanting to book in. Um, and we miss that, then uh, we would potentially miss out on that that business, that that patient, or even obtaining that um, that doctor as a referral source. And so, um, very early on, we made the decision to have a virtual um, virtual assistant and. Uh, we, we actually couldn't, there was none in our region at the time. This is sort of going back 15 years ago or so. And, and so I had to actually go and uh, talk someone into it that, that they ran a, a, um, they ran a, uh, a serviced office. Uh, and so they, they were sort of had the idea, but they did, weren't doing it for offsite, you know, for businesses that weren't within that. So I had to go and convince them um, that it was a good you know, business for them to, uh, to get on the line. But it meant that we would in our case, we had them answering the phone, um, you know, with our business name, we had them trained up, all the rest of it from a confidentiality and, and health privacy point of view. But it meant that we never, ever missed a call. Um, mm. And that that it catapulted our practice, uh, you know, it, and accelerated the growth so much because, you know, we would have not realised all the missed calls that where they wouldn't leave a message. And you just don't, you know, it was an opportunity that we we're missing out on um that would have been invisible you know and we would you know you'd never know that it was that's what the true cost of uh not having you know <laughs> not having an admin person or the savings we were making by doing it ourselves just how expensive those savings were uh yeah. and you know we kept that the service for uh for years in fact until we were sort of had enough that we made a decision that okay there was, there was a tipping point where it became sensible to bring it, it in-house but um yeah that opportunity cost is something that so easy to kind of uh you know just not not see but yeah. uh yeah that's very um it's good okay let's uh jump into um you know what you sort of to look out for um in a va service and i think you know and i think people listening perhaps already may have a sense that the way you approach it <laughs> uh is perhaps a different experience to what they may have had when they're um when they've looked into this space, because there's a, uh, I think, fair to say, you know, whether it's in Australia, in the UK, whether it's in uh, in the US and Canada, that there's a very like large variety of types of services and types of setups that are providing these services. So, um, what are the things you think people really need to sort of look for and focus in on 
when seeking a VA service? And uh, yeah, what, what, what advice could you give people in this space? So, yeah, so the first thing we're around like confidentiality, I think it is really important to look for a VA that specially works with therapists in private practice, psychologists in private practice, you know, works in that field because then they understand it you know really well they understand the confidentiality you know they'll understand hippo in america or gdpr or whatever it is that you know your region um covers so they'll understand all that um you really want to have someone who is professional so they will provide you with a contract the contract should come from the virtual assistant because you are our client so we're you know we're the kind of we're the person that needs to give the contract, yeah. but you can give NDAs, so non-disclosure yeah. agreements. You can sign things, you, you can ask um, virtual assistants to sign. That I have had done that a couple of times. Um, in the UK, we have something called the ICO, um, mm -hmm. which I think is the Information Commissioner Office or something, mm -hmm. but basically um, it's, it's you become a member of that and it means that you have support around GDPR. Mm -hmm. So if, the virtual assistant would make a mistake, they can then go to the ICO and get advice on how to deal with things like that. Um, my third client that I worked with asked me a question in the interview, which was, what would you do if you sent a report to the wrong doctor? Right. It wasn't yeah. to put me on the spot or to like, but she wanted to understand like what, what I would do. Did I understand the procedure around that? Did I understand what GDPR meant and understand what it would mean for that patient that had been, you know, that had got their information sent to the wrong person. So asking that kind of question is is really good because you just get a sense of like, do they actually understand? You know, even if it's I would come to you, like mm -hmm. that's yeah. actually one of the best answers because <laughs> you know because it's like okay, at least they know to like that they would actually tell me if they've done that. Um, I was working for somebody else and somebody sent me a report of somebody that I didn't know, you know, she yeah. wasn't on my client's caseload and I let her know. And I was like, just, you know, I've deleted this. Like it's, I haven't got record of this anymore, but this is not one of our patients. And she was just like, whoops. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah. God. Not Did not instill confidence, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, oh God. Yeah, she didn't, yeah. you know, say, anyway. So, um, so yeah, just kind of like asking, asking questions in the interview and not being worried to do that because, yeah it's your business at the end of the day and they can you know virtual assistants can make mistakes yeah and they can um you know cost you money if you don't get the right person yeah. so i would definitely start with that you know making sure that they have business insurance and asking for a copy of it so you can ask for you know all of these things the ico certificate their business insurance certificate and also get references as well one mm. the best way to find a va is to ask your friends like mm. ask people who are in your industry who are they using yeah. who would they recommend that is going to be the best way for you to find a reliable person yes. because you know, like with everything we're talking about, you know, with therapy practices having, you know, no policies and all that kind of stuff, virtual assistants can also, they can vary in um, yeah. qualifications and not qualifications like actual, you know, degrees and stuff, but yeah. like in, you know, if they're going to stick around for a long time and yeah. things like that, because you don't want to keep training new people all the time. Yeah, yeah. And I think that also um, another mm -hmm. point there that we sort of looked at as well as around, what their turnover of staff is within um, the VA service itself. So are they going to allocate a key person that is actually going to be directly sort of managing the primary plan of contact? Um, if not, what sort of pool of people are going to be, you know, and what their background training, induction, and so forth is to make sure that, uh, because I think there are some uh, VA services that are set up that are not like typically the ones that aren't necessarily focused on health and they may have a high turnover of people within that that service and I think that introduces um, uh, risk you know uh, in that in terms of quality control and also the risk that the training that you might do or the sort of knowledge that the person might get if they're constantly got new people coming through um, then I think the risk of there being an issue goes up you know <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah and there's a difference between hiring one single person because mm. most VAs will just work for themselves it will just be their business and you know they just work for themselves and then you have like an agency so you might have like for example with my agency there's me and then I have a team of people that work day to day mm -hmm. um what you really want to look out for with an agency is that you have one key account manager yeah. so you'll have one person that deals with your account 
90% of the time. And the only time somebody else would step in would be for holiday cover and things like that. Yeah. I've spoken to agencies here where they don't do it like that. And it's like anybody can jump in and do it. And that just fills me with dread because they don't, it takes it takes a few weeks or even months to learn a practice, learn individual clients, because mm -hmm. there's always the clients that like, you can't send that person an invoice, it must only go to their mum, mm -hmm. or you can't, you know, it takes time to learn that kind of stuff. And Power Diary is great for that, because you can add contacts on, and so you can never send an invoice mm -hmm. to the wrong person, because yeah. you say who it's going to go to, right? Yeah. Yeah. But if you don't have a system like that, you need somebody to really understand your, your practice and your clients. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that if if they don't have a um, like a key person identified, and there are some business models where they don't, but then it places it means the importance of having those sort of um, standard operating procedures clearly documented becomes even more. Like the you know, I think that the the more people that might be uh, handling the processes and depending on the, on the degree of service they're providing to, but um, making sure that those things are really well articulated becomes even more important because you get increased variability with increased people uh increase you know service in your account and therefore if it's not very clearly like uh, uh, you know articulated what needs to be done then you get that increased variability and uh, often where we see you know issues arise uh, you know from 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 that so uh yeah that's good and that location you mentioned also here um the uh there's a couple of sort of pitfalls here right so uh when you're looking for a, a va um what what sort of where does location come into it for you okay so and then i do want to go back to the practice management systems after but yeah. with location although they're virtual yeah. and i could technically work for anyone and we did have a client in singapore um i do think though you really want to find someone within like a couple of hours of your time zone yeah. just so that they are you know awake when your clients are awake and if you needed to let's say you needed to cancel your whole day because you were sick yeah. you want the va to be awake to do that you don't want to have to have a cold or whatever it is that you're calling in sick for and then having to email or contact all of your clients yourself yeah. you want to just tell the va I'm sick today, please cancel my day and know that they're going to be around to do that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, location is important just for really for that reason. And that's specific to, I think, this industry mm -hmm. because VAs can literally work for anyone if they're yeah. in a different kind of industry. But with this specific one, I do think you want someone within a couple of hours of your time zone, yes. you know, to, yeah. to maximize uh, the efficiency of the, of the service. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think there's also something about, um, local knowledge that can help be helpful there too it's sort of one of the reasons that we will our um, support teams we have them um, located in the main countries that we serve so um, in australia uk some in europe in um, and then us and canada because um the, the local nuances of what the health system how that health system operates and um it's something that I think it's very hard to do across borders, you know, well, when you're, you're getting down to that nitty gritty detail. And so having, in our case, it's support team members that are located and living in those those countries makes a big difference because then they really kind of understand that context and that environment. And I think uh, for, for patients, it's the same sort of thing if they get the sense that, um, you know, the terminology is a bit different that might be getting used by a VA who might be a long way in a different country different culture things like that that can be you know it can um you know introduce uh concerns and, and can make it a little bit more um you know or less efficient less effective um and reduce confidence sometimes so i think you know having that uh alignment you know it's not you know i think there's there are workarounds but i think it's it makes a huge difference where where there is yeah that uh yeah yeah and things like medical insurance as well that varies so much in different countries whether you know it's like here where it's all private medical insurance but then in america obviously it's totally different like i don't know that system yeah. at all so i could be like great for certain things of american vas but if they needed help with their with that kind of stuff i would have no clue so yeah, yeah definitely understand yeah definitely having that understanding around that as well because that can be a really big part of the the practice so yeah, absolutely and and well, yeah, exactly that so in uh, in australia we have say medicare and our australian support team no medicare there in the us um we have medicare there too but it's actually a completely different type of uh, program and means something very different so our US team, when we cross train so people understand both, but 
uh, if we were trying to provide support out of one country to the other, that some of that nuance can easily kind of be be lost. And yeah, it's the same kind of thing. Um, and you want to jump back into uh, to talk about practice management systems. So this, uh, when looking for a VA service, um, is something that you you sort of flagged as important to look at what they're using. Yeah. So yeah. I think that it's really important that if you do have systems. Uh, whatever it is you're using that you go to a VA that understands them because yeah. there's going to be less training involved because you won't need to train them on the system you'll just need to say I use Power Diary and the VA will be like awesome I know that system and can like pick that part up yeah. yes they'll need to understand your practice nuances but they don't need to know how to add a book in you know mm -hmm. they know how to add a add a system you know add a client or whatever it is so that's really important um getting them to understand you know ha having someone like that but also that can be really helpful because then they'll see what other therapists are doing on the system and if you're not doing it they can say to you do you know what this this process works really well for another client I have maybe if we implemented this it will save you time it will save you money it will speed up clients paying things like that so often when you have a VA that's used to a system and we only work with clients that use power diary for example that's like our chosen you know obviously <laughs> our chosen uh, ehr yeah. and so we won't work with people on other systems because every time someone comes to me it's like i'm using you know write up or click up or whatever it's called i'm like oh my god like why why are you using them because <laughs> yeah and then they complain that they don't do this and they don't do that i'm like yes and that's why if you switch here you can do that so yeah, yeah whatever system it is you're choosing to use you want to use somebody that's used to it, that works with it already for training, also for that benefits of like them being able to come to you with additional processes that you can put in yeah. and just like, yeah, learn it. And also then they'll be quicker. If I was switching between a client who used Power Diary and a client who used something else and then a client who used a different one, I'm going to be slower because I'm going to be not used to using the system and forgetting where things are and then the onboarding process might be slightly different so it's going to slow me down yeah. so you really want somebody that's just used to using you know the one system for all of their clients really yeah and then it becomes a proficient in that and you get that like you said the benefit of other um of them working with other clients in the same system um and the other uh, point to make there too is we can uh if someone is uh going to working with a, a va that hasn't utilized uh, power Diary or might be um then we can also provide that training to um, that, that VA instead of the person feeling they need to do all the training. They, they, the, um, our customer may uh, provide, of course, the training and have their practices set up, but um, often you know, we can uh, go in and, and actually train the, the staff at that um, virtual assistant service so that the customer's not left sort of you know, doing that. Um, and often then, of course, we find when people start using Powder in their VA service, they'll introduce us to other uh other customers as well so it it, it works out well in all regards uh, that's good uh okay let's uh let's jump into um this uh idea about what you can kind of delegate uh to uh to a va so what can you actually get your vas to do and take off your plate basically anything that's not yeah. the actual therapy yeah yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah we can't jump into the room and do the therapy but anything else outside of that we can do yeah. So all of the client communication and people, that's like the one thing that people get really nervous about, like, oh, I don't know if my clients will want to talk to you. But they're so they're so used to now dealing with receptionists and assistants and things like that. It, I really don't ever see that as a problem. You know, as long as you're up front with your clients, let them know that you're working with a VA or let them know that you're starting with a VA they will be fine and anything that they need to do you can deal with that in the therapy room anyway if they have a specific issue that you know you can talk about that with them but that really like I've worked with dozens of clients and this does not come up you know it's a yeah. fear that comes up with everyone yes. but it doesn't actually you know it doesn't it's not a realized fear you know yeah. in the end yeah. yeah so also it can really reduce the communication as well so people think oh like I don't know how you're going to deal with this client because they message me all the time but when you put in that boundary of just so you know for anything outside of you know the therapy room you'll contact Kim now like yeah. Kim's a VA right so you know contact Kim if you need to reschedule your session contact Kim for payment issues and you'll find that that communication will really reduce people yeah. like to contact the therapist a lot more than they will contact the VA yeah so again you won't be having to deal with there's many emails and things like that 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 you are the VA won't yeah. um 
dealing with inquiries so if an inquiry comes in getting a like, discovery call or an intake session or something like that booked in onboarding those new clients sending them a welcome email with all of the information sending them the paperwork you know which all you know can be done online and then entering that information onto any the system you're using so getting all of that information um invoicing and bookkeeping yep so any anything with regards to finances and people think that's going to be difficult as well yeah. um so let's say you're not using stripe and you're just using like backs payments all the va would need is like your bank statement once a week and then they can reconcile payments and chase any overdue ones it really is quite simple i think i think people worry about things like that like oh how will i get that information to you but it's just a really simple you know send us a bank statement and we can we can, you can deal reconcile with that. if they're paying exactly they're paying direct deposits or if you're um working for companies and invoicing companies and they're paying directly into your bank account so uh, i think in uk that backs payment but uh, or uh, other countries they might call it like a direct deposit or a direct money transfer that's going to show up in a bank account it can be reconciled back across uh, and like you say they don't need um access to your actual bank account your online you know banking necessarily or you can even give permission uh, most online banking services will have restricted permission that you can give so someone can view only you know um, access to that business account and and then reconcile from there so uh, yeah it's uh, that can be done fairly easily yeah and then medical insurance like i said so all of the admin around medical insurance which we know can yeah. be really high um and then bookkeeping as well so i think it's really important to do your bookkeeping monthly um and this is a task i know that people don't do they might put off until the end of the tax year and then they really stress out and like oh my god i need to like get all this stuff done for taxing but i think it's really important to know the health the financial health of your business throughout the year and yes. um, so you can make good financial decisions and things like that so you can get that done by the virtual assistant and then they just give you a report each month yeah. that you can easily just look at and see okay what did i make what was my expenses what was my profit yeah. um all things around booking obviously scheduling rescheduling cancellations of appointments and things like that report writing is more like so client notes obviously would be done by the therapist but if a doctor requires a report or if a medical insurance requires a report you can just send your assistant a voice note or type it up really roughly and then they can put it all you know nicely onto a formatted document so really anything there's other mm -hmm. things we do as well some some clients have you know other things going on in their practice maybe they have groups and they so we organize groups and things like that but it's literally kind of anything you can think of that's yeah. not done in the therapy room a virtual assistant can do yeah yeah and often as you were saying before do it more efficiently and uh than what the the you know more efficiently and more cost effectively than what perhaps people can do themselves um the other thing too i think in in getting a lot of these things done is it frees up the sort of headspace of the the therapist and um, because you know, one it's been it's you know it's been sort of kept on top of, so it's not building up, it's not becoming a stress. Um, but also the attention is sort of more focused on being present in you know for the treatment. And whether it's someone who's a, a physio or whether it's it's psychology therapy or whether it's a massage uh, practice, it doesn't really matter that that kind of being present with the person in the room, the patient in the room, is is vital. And if someone is thinking about the fact they're behind on you know invoices and there's phone messages and emails to catch up on and that patient that contacts all the time you haven't replied to them yet you know <laughs> it i know myself like that that it, it divides your attention and it it makes it much more difficult to be present in the moment and with with the person that you're providing a service to and as much as you you try those things you know everyone's human right and it affects that so being able to sort of do that um and like you're saying before if you use a practice management system um, then a lot of these things can be done um, and streamlined through that as well. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah. good, right? So it's more than just like phone calls and emails, right? And that's the sort of the, the take home here, right? Is that people often think about it's just someone to kind of answer the phone if I can't answer the phone, but there's actually a much broader kind of range there. Um, yeah. In terms of best practices uh, for VAs, so we've got like, again, can do more than what, you know, just the, 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 the we were talking about before. So in setting things up, um, you had a few points here around best practices that make a difference. Uh, what what are the things here that are sort of uh, important to keep in mind? Do you think? 
Yeah, so um, we've got practice management system account set up. So this is if you don't currently have a system and you work with a VA that understands it, then they can actually do all the setup for you. So you can get that done and you can work with your virtual assistant on your SOPs to get all that done before you start working day to day with them. So if you're considering, you know, starting with Power Diary or whatever, then you can get somebody to do that for you. Yeah. Um, the thing I love about Power Diary is this, the access permissions. I mean, I say this a lot. The thing I love about Power Diary, and if you watch my YouTube channel, I literally say that all the time. <laughs> and to be clear, we're not paying you to say that, right? Like, this no. Is, uh, no, uh, no, no, but I no, do. On yeah, my yeah, YouTube no. channel, I've noticed yeah. I say that a lot. Um, but the access permissions are great because you set them up at like system level and you will need to give your virtual assistant basically full access because mm -hmm. for them to be able to, you know, add on clients, complete the onboarding process, sort out their invoicing, all that kind of stuff. They do need, you know, high access, mm -hmm. but you can then limit it based on that. So admin and clinical notes, for example. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to store your clinical client notes, on the system, you could do that without your virtual assistant being able yeah. to see it, even though they can see everything else. Yeah. And you can also change access at client level as well. So if you are a group practice, but you don't want all of the therapists to be able to see all of the clients, you can turn off, you know, you can select who can see. So only the main therapist plus the VA can see this information, but yeah. the other therapists within the practice don't have access to this client. Yeah. So I really like that, you know, and it's good to make sure that access permissions are set up properly yeah. but just note that a va will need you know high access to be able to do everything but you know you should trust that person and trust comes with time and you can definitely start slow and say right i just want you to do this one job or yeah. like you can give them test you know test kind of jobs to see how they get on uh, and build up that trust but um yeah you do need to trust your va and you know no they're not going to send your clients dodgy emails or anything like that <laughs> <laughs> and uh in in power diary too you can see um a log file as well um so you can go through and have a look at what um you know every page of that user so sort of, you know you set up a, a user for the admin uh, for the virtual assistant to, to to utilize and then you can see exactly what has been accessed um, there um, I think the other that point too about what you're saying about admin notes um is is something you know from a Power Diary perspective that we thought was very important that for those who may not be familiar about in Power Diary, there's um, uh, clinical forms and admin forms. So there's, uh, let's say uh, you send a form out, online form to collect information on intake and so forth. So you can flag that as clinical or admin. Um, and the same with the clinical, with notes. So you can say it's a clinical note or an admin note um, and that, and then control access to that. So if an admin person wants to write notes which is often helpful you know they've tried to contact someone or they've sent an invoice and they're following up or they've taken a phone call and they want to record that they've got a dedicated admin spot that they can record that um so it's not going to the sort of medical file or the clinical file um but there's a record of it but also the like you said the access is restricted so you know they they can do all the other administrative things but the detail of the clinical you know the clinical notes and the clinical forms uh, blocked and therefore, you know, we're preserving um, that, uh, you know, extra layer of, um, of restriction and making sure that people only have access to information that they need to perform their role. Uh, so uh, that's good. Um, anything else for uh, best practices that uh, things that are, uh, that you've noticed over the years that are that's kind of critical to making it all work well? Um. Well, critical to making it all work well. I'm not sure about that, but I think like with the with the last point with the support in the client practitioner relationship, yeah, you can separate things, right? So yeah. when it comes to invoicing, for example, this is like one of the biggest kind of contention points. I think if you're like chasing for money, I know therapists can really struggle with that. They can struggle asking their clients to pay them, even yeah. though they've, you know, given their service. And I have a lot of clients that really struggle around money. Yeah. And so it can be so much easier for me not knowing that person. I've never met them. I don't see them. I can just easily send them a really polite professional email asking for them to pay for the service they've yeah. had. Yeah. And I've had that before where, you know, I've asked somebody to send a payment reminder. And then the client's gone into the therapy session and said, 
I'm really mad at Kim. She asked me to send her money, but I was going to pay you. I was only a week overdue or something, but it didn't affect that therapeutic yeah. relationship between, because the anger or the, you know, resentment, whatever was put onto me yeah. rather yeah. than it being a massive issue for the client and therapist. And they would have had to like have this long conversation about, you know, whatever, I'm not a therapist, but yeah. you know, yeah. about that relationship. So it can really help support keeping that relationship as it is and then keeping the business side separate yeah. you know if i'm telling a client i'm really sorry yeah that's i'm sorry you've got to cancel this but you've done it under 24 hours so i'm still going to charge you yeah. or yeah. you know enforcing those it's so much easier for a va to enforce those yeah. kind of boundaries that you have set the, the yeah. therapist has set them but it's easier for the va to kind of enforce them rather than the therapist yeah absolutely and i think in addition to preserving that relationship it also increases the financial viability of the practice, right? Because, you know, often where you see ad hoc waiving of fees and whatnot, it's often driven by the awkwardness, you know, that the therapist, you know, um, is concerned about damage in relationship, maybe they're uncomfortable. Um, and often, like I said, not you know, that comfortable with the money side of things anyway, it's sort of a little bit of a, an area that they might not feel super confident about. So, by having that little bit of distance, I think it, it often allows a better enforcement, better consistency for, for the patient experience that, yes, you know, this, we do require that notice. This is the policy. Um, and then that tends to have that kind of flow on effect of people, you know, one, turning up, and two, if they don't, you're not missing out on that that time because the, the policy is being enforced. So it, uh, yeah. and, I mean, it just takes one of those. And um, one, one collection of a missed appointments I mean, and you've covered you know usually like your entire cost of you know your, your service so much. yeah but, you know, i also uh, get that around um low fees See, i i don't know why but people the therapists seem to have a really hard time like charging their full rate so yeah. they'll have their rate on the the website but then they really struggle to say that number to a client yeah. and i had uh, one client and she said oh i'm charging i'm charging somebody less and i said why and she was like well i just got the impression she couldn't afford it and i said tell me the conversation you had yeah. and she said oh like i told her my fee it's a hundred pounds but blah 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 and she just kept talking and i was like why did you talk you didn't even give the person a chance to say yes or no before you assumed that they couldn't pay yeah. so you know even things like that you know having that conversation with the va can be so much more happy to be like this is their fee yeah. end of you know yeah. and so it can yeah so it can just help with that as well you know Absolutely. you're not having to worry about telling people your fee even though it's on your website and you've decided that's what it is yeah and, and it's a more confident experience then too for the patient because it's just this is the fact here it is and that's that's that now i'm mindful that uh we we need to finish up we're nearly uh, out of time but just this is our, actually our, our uh right the, the very last thing we want to kind of cover off is that is there a time or when should people think about, if at all, bringing admin um, in-house? So uh, what are the things that perhaps people need to kind of think about, you know, uh, using an external VA versus um, internalizing that? Yeah, I mean, we work with lots of different clients from, you know, single practitioners to group practices. And we've not ever, we've not got to the point where somebody's like, I actually need someone in-house now. Yeah. Um, the maximum we do for a big, a large group practice of four, four therapists is 40 hours a month. Yeah. So it's still really low. And if you think about if you took somebody on, um, you'd have to pay them a certain, you know, you'd have to pay them a salary and that would be guaranteed whether they did one hour or, or, or four hours or eight hours that day. So I think it, you'd have to be a really big practice to need an, an in-house um person and obviously you would weigh up the cost of like okay well if i'm paying 40 pounds a month versus because a va um will charge more hourly then you would have to pay hourly for a person you know for an employee but then you're not paying the employer tax the national insurance pension contributions things like that mm -hmm. so i i haven't seen any practice need an actual in-house but that's not to say that they don't exist obviously and and you know if you have a lot of people come into the practice and there's a lot of admin around that you know actually in the office yeah, um yeah. then you might need somebody inside but yeah um i think that's if it's sort of set up in the right way it could be start, scaled yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And i think yeah. that's right and i think i think you know, going back to our experience with the practice we got to a certain point um where 
it made sense, you know, to to do that. But that was also in the early days uh, with Powder as well, where we didn't. That was before we had things like um, uh, integrated uh, credit card billing, before we had online forms, things like that. So there was a point where, um, from an administrative point of view, like having people um, in house, you know, providing admin would allow for more of those sort of practical things to be done. But as uh, software, you know, in, in our case, you know, Power Diary sort of developed, then we've built in more and more features to kind of minimize that need that you know, people will have their automatic appointment reminders, they'll have their online forms. So they've got all the information, there's no paper forms yeah. that people have to fill out. Um, payments can be done, you know, using the integrated, you know, stored credit cards and so forth, so that there's less of that actual interaction um, required. And it means that it's more conducive now to using um, virtual you know, admin and doing that externally. So, so I think the take home you're saying there is there's no magic point <laughs> at which people need to, but uh, the uh, yeah, looking at that kind of value and, and the number of practitioners. Okay, finally, uh, just where can people get uh, more information about you? And one thing I, I think you, you mentioned just before, but I should uh, say is that uh, right now, um, you're not actually taking on any uh, new uh, customers, your books are kind of full at the moment, so there might be some disappointed people uh, out out there about that. But they can actually still get some information and tips and some uh, some uh, guides and resources and things um, from you. So uh, yeah, what, where should people go and what what do you have there? Sure. So yeah, my website's up there, and I have so many free resources there. So I told you about the private practice workflow, which will really help you get started with your SOPs. I also have a business starter, business uh, setup checklist, um, which is specific to the UK. But if you're starting a practice in the UK, it's got a checklist of all the things that you should do to get your business started. There's loads of other there's loads of other free resources on, on there, like email templates and things like that. Um, I've also got a free Power Diary setup guide and checklist. So it really helps you get all of the information out of your head into a workbook so that you can then get your Power Diary set up. Because yeah. um, I truly believe in the system, like I said. So and I'm, you know, I wouldn't be here if I didn't. So <laughs> um, and also I've got a YouTube channel. Um, which I love doing. I love doing YouTube and I've got I've got about 60 videos on there at the moment with all stuff around private practice, all kind of stuff we've talked about, but it's not just about VA stuff. I talk about finances over there. I've got a whole playlist on Power Diary as well. I've got like a tutorial, an overview of the system, how we onboard clients using Power Diary and, load, and you know, considerations that you might want to think about um, when you're looking at having an EHR. So there's loads of um, things on there. So I'd love people to go and check out the channel. Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, uh, yeah, definitely go check it. I mean, I, I personally think you give way too much away for free. Like, I think it's amazing the resources that you have uh, have on there. And uh, so uh, definitely encourage people to go and, and check out the, the, the things that you have. I think you've got a great you know insight into running practices and you've got a strength in this that a lot of people struggle with and i know we're talking a little bit in the uk context because that's where, where you know you're located but what you're saying i i absolutely know resonates you know in the other uh globally you know that those same things we hear it in all the different markets it's the same types of issues that, that people uh, have so definitely uh if you uh like what kim's been saying check out um check out kim's website and youtube channel we're going to send out um a copy of this um uh, webinar and we're going to put some links in there as well so that people want to find out uh more and uh, have a look at some of the amazing things that you uh, do generously give away uh they'll know exactly where uh where to go uh finally just if you need help with anything with uh, power diary of course our team's um, always there so you can contact um, the support uh there's online um chat there you can book live one-on-one -on -one, you know uh, video phone call uh, and we've got the knowledge base and everything there as well. So anything we can help with, and um, you have any questions, then do uh, let us know. So, well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Kim. It's been uh, great uh, talking to you, and uh, you've been very generous with your time and with your information, and uh, I'm sure people have got a lot out of it. So uh, thank you very much. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.